Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Aaron Siegel uh, to our show today. Dr. Siegel is a senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at Hebrew University in Yerushalayim. He's a former assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Yeshiva College, Yeshiva University. Uh, he has his PhD from Notre Dame, a bastion of Jewish studies. And uh, he also has his master's from there and, and had uh, rabbinical ordination as well from the chief rabbinate of Israel, including many, many other accomplishments and distinguished uh, academic career, as well as a three pages full of publications, including one that hasn't, I don't think is available yet, called Do We Have a Soul? which is an interesting uh, back and forth between him and Eric Olson. A fascinating right. conversation, which should be available soon, I believe. It's not so, available yet. Yeah, public, it should be published this year, hopefully, yeah. in a few months. Yeah, yeah. so th thank you for joining us today. And also, by the way, some of you may know uh, Dr. Siegel because his wife is a Chicagoan, <laughs> the former Chaya Popko, the current Chaya Siegel. So thank you again. Uh, you know, it's the first time I'm having a philosopher in a conversation which I think can be a little bit intimidating uh, because when I tried to understand your specific area of philosophy, I decided I can't understand it. So let me ask a simple question okay. for you. Um, <laughs> why is it important that we study philosophy? Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. I, and thank you for having me. Uh, and it's great to be in Chicago, even if only virtually. Um, yeah, so why is it important to study philosophy? That, that's a question you could spend a long time um, talking about, uh, days, months. Um, but maybe before even talking about why it's important to study philosophy, it's just maybe I could say a little bit about um, what I think studying philosophy is um, and what it isn't, um, just for a few seconds even, um, because I think there is some confusion uh, um, among, let's say, in, in the Jewish community, probably more broadly than that, um, there's this, I think, idea that like philosophy is some sort of like settled body of doctrines. This is like the way they talked about it in the medieval period. Like there, there was like the philosopher who was Aristotle, um, and you had to sort of reconcile Torah with um, philosophy in the sense like philosophical truth that like there's this this stuff out there um, that's uh, you know a body of of views, doctrines, and those are philosophical. And if we want to be philosophical and Torah observant, um, how are we going to, you know, um, reconcile these? And that's the way like faith and reason is often portrayed as this tension. But I think it's um, it, it's sort of like an outmoded way um, of thinking of uh, philosophy. Maybe it was never really accurate. Um, I think it's better to think of it as like a, a kind of inquiry um, uh, into certain kinds of questions. So the kinds of questions are like just very, very um, very general um, about um, how sort of the, the world hangs together, how the pieces of the world hangs to, hang together. And that could be about, you know, the, the good life, um, whether there's any such thing as right and wrong, um, what the world is ultimately made of, um, you know, ha what it takes to know things. So these are very, very general questions, more general than you get even in, in um, things like sciences um, and history. Um, and it's sort of just, be really stubborn and, and um, dogged um, in the attempt to think through these things as carefully as possible. Okay. So, so it's like a way of thinking, um, in a way maybe even of living. So um, for instance, in your upcoming book, The Do We Have a Soul? Yeah. There's a debate you have with another philosopher, with Eric Olson, yeah. trying to figure out if we really have an ashama, how you can prove it, how you can see it. Yeah, right, right. And, then, and so, yeah. No, go ahead. So, yeah. yeah so, so I mean, it, sort of that. That's a, I think a good example of a philosophical question. And also, we we do our best to try to conduct the debate um, in as as clear a manner as possible. So it's supposed to be um, we get we kind of lay out the terms from the beginning, get everything on the table, and try to clarify as much as we can. You know, what's at issue in, in a way that, despite the fact that it's a debate, it's not like um, we're trying to score points, right? I mean, um, uh, each side is, is doing his best um, to be as clear-headed and as charitable um, as can be uh, to the other side, because we're just trying to figure out the truth of the matter. Um, and so we spend a good deal of time, you know, setting up the question, because very often, and, and I think people 
don't appreciate this. People are not sort of professional philosophers or reading philosophy. But, um, a big part of the philosophical enterprise is just getting clear on the questions. Um, some, some questions, you know, never really uh, occur to you until you start thinking very vaguely and incoherently about um, some familiar phenomena. And then when you try to think hard about them, um, you, you generate new questions. And in some cases you have questions already, like, do we have a soul? That's probably a question, um, you know, everyone can understand, you know, at a, at a pretty um, simple level, um, but then you wanna get clear on what it would be uh, for something to be a soul, what it would be to have a soul um, uh, and its relationship to other questions we might ask about human beings and the world. So, so that's like the first part. And, and like I said, in philosophical inquiry, that's often a big part of, of what you're doing, right? And then we start giving arguments. So th th that's the next big part is, is trying to give arguments. So is, you know, there was a time when philosophy was uh, very controversial within the, the, the Jewish world. Is it something right. that's outside, inside? And I know I'm going back a long time ago, but nowadays is, what role do you think that, uh, philosophy has within the Orthodox Jewish world? Right. Yes, yeah, so it's a, a good question. Um, yeah, and it certainly has been controversial, probably at every point uh, uh, in the history of, of that sort of interaction uh, from the um, from sort of the birth of philosophy, or maybe if you, you know, a few hundred years later when you have Philo. Um, but ever since then, I don't think it's been uh, an easy relationship at all. Um, you know, you've had uh, traditional thinkers, maybe before there was such a thing as orthodoxy, but traditional thinkers, we've shown him um, and Achronim, um, who were very much opposed to uh, the study of philosophy. Um, and of course, we've shown him and Achronim, uh, who, who were supportive of it and all sorts of um, positions in between. And I don't think much has changed in that regard nowadays. I, mean, I think um, just descriptively speaking, that's probably true. You know, um, I think you have um, opposition, um, maybe uh, uh, less than in the olden days, um, uh, just because I, I think the, the maybe the um, the battle lines were clearer back then. Uh, you know, now there are so many issues on the table, so many disciplines, um, and probably the people who would be opposed are are unfamiliar, I think, with what I'm calling philosophy. So it's it hard, they'd be hard pressed to say um, what's wrong with it. But nonetheless, I think you still do have, um, well, was have it, opposition. Was it more a question of, um, they were questions that people didn't want to ask? Or was it more a question of saying, no, this is a non-Jewish approach, whether you're talking mm. about Aristotle or Plato, or more modern approach, whether it's Wittgenstein or others that's saying, hey, we don't want them in our tent. Or we, right. or we just, we don't have to worry about what whether or not we have a neshama. God said we have a neshama. Now let's move on. Yeah, I think, so you probably have, not probably, you have both of those uh, sentiments expressed by, by different thinkers and sometimes by um, by the same thinker, by the same um, post I, I mean, you know, so the, the idea that we, we shouldn't be importing, um, you know, foreign material, uh, and, and philosophy is sort of like the, the paradigm of that. Um, you, you have that at several points. You know, I'm thinking right now of like the, uh, the dispute between the Rama and the Maharshal, um, the Rama of Moshe Israelis, um, the famous Ashkenazi Posik, as the Maharshal was as well, but we follow the Rama and know him better. Um, the Rama was actually somewhat pro-philosophy um, uh, and, uh, and said so. Um, and there's a famous exchange between him and the Marshal where uh, the Rama brings up um, a passage from, from Aristotle. Um, it's not really playing a, a critical halachic role, but the Marshal still takes him to task just for who, why are you bringing in these non Jews, these Gentile thoughts into a halachic discussion of all places? Um, but then you also, of course, have the, the opposition that stems from the kinds of questions that are being asked and the willingness to ask them with an open mind. Um, you have that even within the greatest of Jewish philosophers, by you know, which I mean the Rambam. I mean, the Rambam himself, 
you know, maybe I'll get back to your question actually that you started with, <laughs> what's the value of philosophy? But uh, before we get to uh, that and the Rambam's very positive things that he has to say about the value of philosophy, he does have some rather um, critical things to say and some rather um, uh, um, severe strictures that he um, places upon philosophical inquiry. I mean, maybe the most extreme is a statement in Hilchot um, Avodat Tochavim, Laws of Idolatry, Perek Bet, where um, he seems to just rule out inquiry into any theological or metaphysical question, um, just says that it's usur, um, and, and doesn't qualify it, at least not straightforwardly, doesn't qualify the prohibition as applying only to certain people or only at certain stages, um, which is obviously very difficult to square with everything else the Rambam says or much of what the Rambam says. Um, but, but there he basically, you know, is saying it could very much, very easily lead you astray. You know, if you're, if you're not well prepared, so when he gives his rationale, he does talk about um, the dangers for those who are not, you know, um, well versed in the canons of logic and reasoning and um, all the other things the Rambam thought you needed to know before you could engage in metaphysics and, and theology. Um, you know, it could really destroy the world is how, how he puts it. Um, so how did the, let's go back to your comment about the Ramah and the, and the Marshal. So we're talking 17th, 16th, 17th century. And how did they have access to, to Aristotle? Was it translated into Hebrew? Was it, did they? Well, so, okay, okay, there, that's an excellent point. And um, the, the Ramah makes a point of saying that he didn't read Aristotle uh, in the original. Um, or even in translation, but by, by the original, I mean he didn't read it as, as in as a clerishon, so to speak. I mean he he says, you know, I didn't uh, uh, study Aristotle. I really studied just the Rambam's Mor Nevuchim, and that's how I um, I got um, to be so uh, you know knowledgeable of whatever I know uh, of Aristotle. Um, that seems to be more of a uh, um, an apologetic claim um, in, his, in his response to the Marshal, whom he held in, in great esteem, but they had this deep dispute. Um, uh, so as not to offend him, I think he, he basically says, you know, I, I was really just learning um, the Rambam's Mor Nebuchim, but it does seem, um, scholars, I think, have suggested that the Rambam had um, uh, much more knowledge than he lets on in that tshuva. Um, even firsthand, um, not, in, not in the Greek, but uh, <laughs> that he would have had um, uh, awareness and knowledge of of much beyond just the Rambam's Mar Um Yeah, hey, he, he says, I only learned it on Shabbos, you know, so it's uh, only the Rambam and only, only on Shabbos. Don't worry, I didn't spend any of my weekdays. Then I did just halacha. And, and nowadays, are there a lot of people going into philosophy from within the Jewish community? Um, so unfortunately, um, no, <laughs> there are not. Um, not very many, um, you know, there's the, the Jewish community at large, the Orthodox community in particular. It's a very small group of people um, who, are, who are going into this in the sense they're pursuing PhDs and trying to do this professionally. Um, you know, maybe over the past few years, I think we, I'm seeing, we're seeing a number of, um, of young, uh, uh, you know, undergraduates who are looking into this and then and starting um, graduate careers. And the hope is, you know, they'll, make um, careers out of this. But until this point, it's been um, a really uh, small handful. And I think that's lamentable. And maybe now I can actually address your question about the value that you asked at the beginning, because um, I do want to say something about what I think is valuable about, um, about philosophy for the Jewish community. I mean, there's lots to say about what's value, valuable about philosophy in general. Um, and I mean, I, I don't think it needs to be valuable um, to have a reason to do it or to want to do it. I mean, it could just be like, it's really fun and interesting, but, but I do think it has, um, it has value. Um, I mean, I think it has sort of intrinsic value, sort of um, just living a reflective life. That's something that's intrinsically valuable. And if we're getting back to the Rambam now, so I shouldn't give the impression that the only thing the Rambam said about philosophy was that you, know, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Obviously, that's not, not the case. Um, you know, you have the, the, the places in the Rambam's work, both in the Mishnah Torah and the Mordechim, where he places it on a pedestal, both, you know, religiously speaking, and even sort of as, as the paradigm of Torah, 
um, you know, that, that's really the, the biggest chiddish, um, the biggest novelty, I think, in what the Rambam says and how he characterizes philosophy. Um, you know, that's, that's what he says in Hilchot um, Talmud Torah and Perik Dalid, um, that uh, these things, pardes, are part of Gemara, what he, what he calls Gemara. Um, and, and Gemara for him seems to be, and there's, there's uh, Torah Shabbat, Torah Shabbat, and that's just sort of like knowing uh, Tanakh, knowing the, the text of Torah Shabbat, and then there's Gemara, the third, which is, you know, once, once you've mastered the first two, you're supposed to spend most of your time grappling um, with the, the received knowledge, with the, the text that you have, but trying to understand, trying to extrapolate, trying to compare. That includes for him not just the standard text that we have um, of, of Mishnah and Gemara, but it includes metaphysics. Um, it includes philosophy uh, more generally. Um, and in, in the Mornavuchim, I mean, it's not a matter there of including in Torah, but toward the end of the Mornavuchim in a very famous or notorious passage, depending on what side you're on, um, I mean, he, he places quite explicitly the Talmidei Chachamin who know what we would say, you know, Shas and Poskin, backwards and forwards, but don't haven't really given any thought to philosophical questions. He places them on a, a, a lower rung, um, spiritually speaking, uh, in terms of how close they are to, to God, um, than the one who um, has then also pursued philosophical um, questions, of course, with the appropriate training, according to the Rambam. So, I mean, that's sort of the opposite extreme, right? I mean, it has this intrinsic value within Torah, within the, um, the, the world of, of Judaism. But what can it do, like, for us nowadays, right? I mean, so that's all well and good. And, uh, you know, that, when we ask like, what the value is, you could ask what the value is for an individual, what the value is for, uh, for the community. I think you probably should, you know, definitely distinguish between those and, and also distinguish between whether you're asking about someone who's already interested in these questions and asking them and someone who you know, has no interest as of now and you're trying to encourage them to do so, I don't know if we should give the same answer there. But at any rate, if we're talking about like what this would do for the Jewish community, what it could do if more people um, were, were, were philosophically inclined and trained, um, I think you could say a lot of things, but I'll just say a few. So one of them, um, uh, is that regarding you know contemporary debates within the Orthodox community about hot button issues, issues that are right now hot button issues, and issues that are around the corner? Um, uh, philosophy encourages uh, a sense of intellectual humility. Um, it should, at least ideally, it doesn't always, uh, maybe not even um, uh, often, uh, but but that when philosophy is d done well, I think. Um, it, it encourages a real sense of intellectual uh, humility um, and integrity about trying to get to the truth. I mean, like I said about this debate with Eric Olson, um, you know, I, I, we're both, um, I think, open and honest about how much we can know and how much we can show um, and how much we can't. Um, and we're both trying to be as charitable as we can uh, to the other side. Um, and I think that's just sort of encouraged by a, a philosophical approach to uh, to questions. Um, and we could use a lot more of that uh, in the world at large, but in the Orthodox Jewish community in particular, um, you know, very often it just very quickly devolves into um, highly passionate, um, which is, it's great to have passion, but uh, when that spills over um, into uh, being more self-assured, and um, uh, speaking with greater confidence than your evidence warrants, um, and it very often does that, uh, then, then the whole discourse is, is sort of suffering um, because of that. Um, I mean, I think the advantages of philosophy, of doing philosophy for sort of training yourself to think clearly also um, contribute, should contribute uh, to, to civil discourse and productive uh, discourse. So that's sort of all at the level of the, the form, not the content of what we're discussing, right? But these hot button issues are like, can we discuss them in a civil and productive way? And I think even there, um, philosophy could play a um, big role. Um, I think for that to happen, it would have to be much more widespread. So, you know, it would have to be taught um, 
at, at you know, maybe in the high schools already. And I don't know what's going on at Ida Crown. Um, I can only speak to my um, upbringing uh, and from what I know, and also what's going on here in Israel. It's just not. It's just not part of the religious education to actually do some philosophy. No, I think here, it, used the, to be, yeah. it used to be more once upon a time when I was in high school, I remember we had to take a class and we had a reader in Philo and in, really? uh, in the Kuzari and in uh, the Rambam that we had to, that right. we, we worked on. Uh, yeah. But nowadays, I don't know if people have time to reflect and to think. I think it's also a reflection right. of society. Show yeah. me, you know, uh, show, show me, me, the, the, yeah, show me the, the content, show me the uh, the accomplishment. How does it do on a PSAT or an SAT or an ACT or how many blot can you learn? Uh, yeah. Is there a yeah, tension? Yeah. yeah. Is there a tension today, do you think, between the the proclivity for people to want to rely on Das Torah, on mm -hmm. saying there's somebody who knows more than I know and I can just ask them what to do? A certain fundamentalist approach, and may and versus those who want to take a more reflective approach. Um, you're a Talmud yeah. of Aaron Lichtenstein. I know he had a famous piece on Amunas Chachamim on Das Torah, where he said he right. believes in Das Torah, but how many Rav Shlomo Zalmans are there in this world? Um, right, right, uh, yeah, right, exactly. So um, I think, I mean, I, and I think he would also say, um, but I'll just speak for myself, uh, not for Rav Aaron. Um, that yeah, a large part of this is going to depend on on the individual and the the kind of intellectual and just overall um, character um, uh, tendencies that the person has. So you know there are going to be people who are already bothered by certain questions um, and not giving them a philosophical education of any sort. Um, I think is just uh, I wouldn't say negligent, but it's very unwise because those people are already sort of thinking about these questions. Um, they're, they're bothered by them. Um, and uh, all you're doing in, in sort of not um, uh, exposing them to philosophy more formally is just making it so that the thinking that they're doing is less disciplined, um, less rigorous, uh, and less, less productive. And, and I think ultimately also, um, less likely um, to be spiritually and, and religiously fruitful, right? I mean, they're just going to struggle, um, but that's only true of some people. Um, I'm not suggesting that everyone has these proclivities. Um, it's certainly far from the case. Um, and so like, you know, I'm not one to speak to curriculum. You're the dean of the, of the uh, high school. Um, but, you know, if you were to introduce a class, and, and I, I think it's great that you did, Philo and, and the Kuzari and, and um, several other Jewish philosophers you did, I think it would actually be a great idea to just have, or not just, but have a, a more like intro to philosophy, but with, with, with some Jewish philosophers in the conversation. Um, so that they're actually like doing philosophy, going back to the, how I characterized it at the beginning. It's not just like studying these great Jewish philosophical thinkers, but understanding what it is uh, to philosophize I think that would be fantastic, but of course, I wouldn't suggest that you make that sort of a required course for for everyone. I don't think that makes sense. Um, you know, I think you should offer that, or someone should offer that. Yeah. It should be offered um, to those what who a, want that. What do you think are the big questions that people are asking, or should be asking, or are thinking about, and don't even know that they can ask? Yeah, um, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, so. The, sort of, you, you could start from the hot button issues, um, which I guess everyone is at least talking about, if not thinking about. Um, uh, and, and very often, some of those hot button issues get wrapped up, um, rightfully or wrongfully, um, uh, with broader philosophical questions, some that are like maybe considered, um, you know, just perennial uh, questions about free will, okay, for example, um, uh, you know, so certain hot button issues, let's say about LGBTQ, um, sometimes spill over into uh, issues about free will and uh, determinism. Um, I think we've uh, seen that recently um, uh, in some discussions. 
it would be helpful, I think, um, if, if those who want to have that conversation and think deeply about these things, and we should, we should definitely be thinking deeply about these things. You know, I think they're high school students or young people in general who are very um, bothered, um, are looking for answers. Um, but this is not an isolated issue, right? I mean, uh, that, that's part of what you get from philosophical training is seeing these things in a much broader um, way or as part of um, a, a broader constellation of, of issues and questions. So, you know, just, just grappling with issues about free will, um, issues about um, identity, um, essentialism, uh, these are sort of old philosophical chestnuts, but they're, they're, they're ones that are like timeless um, and um, always relevant. So the, you know, they're, they're playing into contemporary discussions of these very important questions. Um, but just, I think most people uh, just don't have the tools to think through these in a, in a clear way. It doesn't stop people from making very firm pronouncements um, one way or the other about the big philosophical issues and uh, how they uh, apply to these, these concrete issues. But of course it should, it should, be, it should give people a pause. Like, yeah, these, these are questions that have been discussed for thousands of years uh, and people have had some really interesting and intelligent things to say. Maybe we should look at um, what they have to say about them. Um, you know, I don't know if the, the question of whether we have a soul is something that really gets people um, exercised or, or um, keeps people up at night. Um, sometimes I think it's important to expose uh, ourselves and, and young people, old people, to questions they wouldn't otherwise be troubled by. Um, just because, wow, uh, it turns out that's an important and deep question that I hadn't given much thought to. But also they could be re you know, relevant to, again, what I'm calling hot button issues. Um, you know, I, I think the question of whether we have a soul and its relationship to our body, our body is, um, you know, comes in male and female forms, but uh, one can ask about whether the soul has any gender. Um, and I'm just sort of shooting from the hip here in terms of the relationship yeah. between the, those broader questions and the questions uh, you know, that everyone's talking about, but, but they're very relevant, I think. And if you were to suggest a, uh, a, a primer, a, a simple beginning piece for people who want to be able to start thinking in that fashion, who haven't had the training, is there something accessible? Um, yeah, um, you know, I would, yeah, I would pick up like um, Thomas Nagel's uh, very short introduction to philosophy. I mean, I, what I'm trying to describe is something that sort of just gets you to understand like what philosophy is, um, or, or Bertrand Russell's the problem of problems of uh, philosophy. Um, these are extremely accessible introductions to philosophy. They don't give you like the history of philosophy. They just give you a sense of what it is to philosophize and sort of whet your appetite. And if you're kind of the kind of person who finds that uninteresting, then you're not going to want to read more anyway. <laughs> um, but if the person who has, you know, um, proclivities, proclivities in, in the philosophical direction, I think, you know, once you read that, you're just going to be like, wow, uh, there's a whole world out there um, uh, of stuff I should be reading and thinking about. We only have about another minute or so. If you were to list who are the the stars today in the Jewish world of philosophy, are there certain names out there that are really the ones that we should be looking at? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, so uh, I don't want to get in trouble here. So there's the whole world of like scholarship of Jewish philosophy, right? I mean, like scholars of um, um the history of Jewish philosophy. And I'm not gonna mention any of those names, but that's not to say they're not great scholars. Um, but if we're thinking about people who are doing like constructive um, work um, in, in philosophy and trying to do it in a, in a Jewish vein or together with Jewish topics, you know, um, David Schatz was a great mentor of mine and continues to be a mentor of mine. And I think he's a, a leader um, in this regard. Um, Jerome Gelman, um, I have a friend, Sam Liebens, um, who's, who's a leader in, in this field. Um, again, I'm sure I'm leaving out some names uh, and I don't mean to, to offend anyone. So anyone whom I've left off should be on that list. <laughs> and I guess on that on that note, with with that yes. uh, with, with that necessary uh, qualification, I really appreciate your time. Our time is up. 
I okay, would, thank you so much. Uh, I, I find it fascinating because it's such a core stu- subject that we really don't spend the time on. And I'm glad yeah. that you're one of those people who will be on my list. Um, and, <laughs> I, and I wish you and much more success. And you should have Talmidim Harbeb. Keep them growing. Amen. And I think it'll make a difference. The humility factor that you spoke of earlier is so very, very true and so much lacking in our community today. So thank you very much. Great thank to you. see you. And I look forward to seeing you maybe on a visit to Chicago or my visit to Israel. We'll see. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.